Hey guys, welcome to our service. I'm so glad that you're tuning in today. If you didn't know, Church on the Move is a family of churches. We have three locations across Northeast Oklahoma. So if you live near one of our locations, come out and join us in person. We have incredible worship and teaching, and of course, amazing environments for kids and students that we want you and your family to experience for yourselves. If you have questions, you can drop a comment below or visit churchonthemove.com for more info. Now enjoy the service. Ephesians chapter four, we are diving right in, picking up where we left off last week because we've been walking through the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter four, verse one says, therefore, and I told you last week, anytime you see a therefore, you need to look what it's there for. And we've covered that in the, the previous weeks of all of the things that Paul has laid out. And so go back and listen to some of that and, and look at that. But he says, therefore, I, a prisoner, Serving for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling that you've been called to by God. Always in your relationships, always be humble, always be gentle, always be patient with each other, making allowance and making room for each other's faults because you love each other. Make every effort to keep yourselves united. Why? Because there are forces in this world that are trying to keep us divided. And to stay united, to stay together, to stay in relationship takes work. It takes intentionality. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and there is one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. Growing up, there were many seasons and times in my life where dad and I would have some confrontational conversations. I often called these nose-to-nose conversations because that's how me and dad had difficult conversations. Nose-to-nose, eyeball-to-eyeball, man-to-man. And we would just have, I would do something wrong. I would make a mistake. I would back talk mom and we would have a nose to nose eyeball to eyeball conversation and what I loved about those well I didn't love those conversations in the moment what I love now about those conversations looking back is that what dad was doing is he was calling me to a new place and to a new level and to a new maturity He would, when I I was young and I was weak and I was incapable of doing certain things, I would get used to that way of living. But as my body would mature, as my mind would mature, I would become capable of doing things and being responsible for chores around the house that previously I was incapable of. But I wasn't convinced I was capable I was living like I was incapable. And dad would at that time get down on a knee and get nose to nose with me and eyeball to eyeball and say, son, I need you to recognize who you are. I need you to recognize you've grown. I need you to recognize you have strength that you didn't have. So I need you to grow up. And I need you to take some more responsibility around the house. I need you to stop living like you used to be and start recognizing who you are. And as I would grow and as I would get a little bit older, and now I'm now he's 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 here and we're having nose to nose, eyeball to eyeball. And eventually as I got into high school, he's now doing this. (laughs) And he's 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 on his tiptoes, but he's still letting me know he's the man in the house. (laughs) And we're having eyeball to eyeball nose-to-nose conversations, and it was always, I need you to recognize who you are and stop living like you used to be. You're stronger, you're smarter, you're more mature. That's the conversation that Paul is having with the Ephesians church here in chapter four. He's, what I imagine through his letter and through his posture, he's having a nose-to-nose, eyeball-to-eyeball conversation with these believers in the book of Ephesus. Let's continue on after he's told us in verse four, there was one body, one spirit, and we've been called to this glorious hope for there is one God, there is one Lord, there is one faith, there is one baptism, one God and one father of all who is over all, who is in all, who is living through all. 
However, he has given each of us a special gift. He, I love this, that he immediately acknowledges, listen, the entire body of believers, God's made an investment on the inside of you. This isn't about just a few chosen, special, uber anointed, God called pastors or apostles or leaders. No, this is about a body. This is about a family. And every single one of you have been given a gift. He's been, you've been given a gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why scripture says when he ascended on heights, he led, cap, he led a crowd captive and gave gifts to people. He gave gifts to people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens. Why? So that he might fill the entire universe with himself. There's a lot of complexity there and a lot of theological room for debate and conversation. But here's basically what he's saying is God was in a heavenly place. Jesus was in a heavenly place. He recognized our incapacity and uh, ability to fix the problems we'd gotten ourselves into. So he descended from his heavenly place of authority and privilege and comfort. And he came here to earth. He accomplished a lot of great things. He broke what, what it was that was controlling us and keeping us in a sinful death uh, filled life. And he made a way for us to now be a part of God's family. And now that he was put to death, he was buried, he was resurrected. Now he's ascended back to heaven and he's given us the responsibility for growing and building this thing called the church in partnership with him and in partnership with his spirit. In verse 11, he says, now there, these are, I would like to say a few, it, it doesn't say that, but it, it says Here's a few. I, think, I don't think this is an exhaustive list. I don't think this is the only gifts that God gave the body of Christ. Because he just said God gave a gift to every one of us. And so he's saying, let me give you some examples of some of the gifts that Christ gave to the church. He gave apostles to start things and to, to pioneer new works and take the gospel into new places. He gave prophets that can hear from the, 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 the voice of God and relay that message to God's people. He gave evangelists, people that are consumed with going into places and connecting with lost people um, and, and introducing them to the real Jesus. He gave us pastors who are passionate about caring for people and loving people and helping people grow. He gave us teachers. Why? Because we need to learn some things. There's some things in life and in this Christianity and in following Jesus that we need to learn. So he gave us teachers. Their responsibility is not to do everything. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do the work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we have all come to such a unity in our faith and a knowledge of God's son that we will be mature. Mature in our relationship with God. Mature in our understanding of who Jesus is. Mature in our understanding of what Jesus has accomplished. Mature in understanding how that's affecting my life and how I live. And he's saying again, grow up. I need you to recognize that God's doing something and he's maturing you and he's developing you. And the thing that we measure ourselves against the standard in which we measure ourselves against is not the person sitting next to us. It, it's not the family that lives down the road. It's not the church across the street. It's not the pastor. It's, it's not anyone else. He says, we're going to measure ourselves against the standard of Christ. In other words, I'm going to look at my life and I'm going to hold my life up next to what I see in scriptures about the life of Jesus. And I'm going to compare and say, okay, I'm not there yet. I've still got growth. I've still got things to learn. I've still got things to change. I've still got things to tweak. Why? Because my life doesn't perfectly match up and measure up to the standard in which Jesus lived. And that's the standard we're continually comparing ourselves to. Not anybody else. Now, I'm not looking at you. You're not looking at me. The Bible actually says quit comparing yourselves among yourselves. The only thing we should be comparing ourselves to is the standard of Scripture and the standard of the life that Christ lived. Come on. Come on. And so we measure ourselves, we examine ourselves, 
And he says, when we do this, when, when, when we do what? When the body understands who you are and I understand who I am and you understand the gift that God put in you and I understand the gift and the gifts that God's put in me and put in us, because it's not just one. I think you've got multiple gifts. You've got multiple talents. Some of you have multiple personalities. Um, <laughs> and, and we need all of you, every one of you, in all of your beautiful complexity because God puts some good stuff on the inside of you. And when we recognize this and when we start living in who we are and stop living in who we used to be, now the church begins to grow and mature. So this is a one-sided relationship and everything is dependent upon a few to do the work of the ministry. The church is never gonna grow and be complete until what? The entire body recognizes who we are together and the fact that we're better together. That's why he begins the passage with, listen, relationship is critical. So make room for each other. Make room for each other's imperfections. You're not gonna do this perfectly. You're not gonna do this flawlessly, but be humble, be gentle, be kind, make room for each other, be patient with each other, be peaceful, and fight to keep unity and connection and togetherness. He says in verse 14, if we do this, then we'll no longer be immature like children. I love it in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 13, Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I acted like a child, I behaved like a child, but when I became a man, when I became an adult, I put away childish things. And I think that's a word for some of us that, hey, we're believers, we're Christ followers. We are maturing in our relationship with God and so we need to put away childish things that used to define our lives. Some of you are letting who you were define who you are. And you're letting that be the thing that determines how you behave and how you do relationship and how you do marriage and how you do church. You're letting things in your past that have hurt you define how you interact with God and with God's people today. And he's saying, hey, we've we've grown up, we've matured. And so when we do all of the things that he's telling us here in, in chapter four, we will no longer be immature like children. We'll put off childish things and childish behavior We won't be tossed around and blown around by every wind of new teaching. There's gonna be some stability. There's gonna be some depth. There's gonna be some maturity in our understanding of God's word and our understanding of who God is and what God's doing in our life. We're gonna be filled with the spirit of God and the spirit of God's gonna be teaching us and leading us and guiding us. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. You know, this is... It's really difficult and frustrating to live in today's world. You, you Google anything, and there's going to be 100 people that'll tell you fried eggs will kill you. <laughs> don't eat fried eggs. It, it, don't, don't, eat, don't eat bacon grease. Those people are of the devil. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, it's going to kill you. you gotta, and then there's 100 people that are saying, listen... This is, this is the best thing for you. You need four pounds of bacon grease every day. And it's like, who, what? I, I, I don't know what to believe. I don't know what. But man, when we've grown up, and that's a silly example, but when we've grown up in our relationship with God and we've been filled with God's spirit, there's something about mature believers that just have a discernment that know what the truth is. They can see through the false and the pretend, and the fake, and the image, and the lies, and they can see through to the core, and there's a maturity in the church where we need to continue to grow in our relationship with God, and our relationship with the Holy Spirit, so that we can find the truth in an evil world that's continually trying to deceive and trick us into doing things, into believing things that will hurt us. Verse 15, instead... Instead of being consumed with lies, instead of being tricked, instead of being deceived, instead of being unstable, instead, we're going to be people that speak God's truth in love. We're not going to use truth as a weapon to hurt people. 
We're not going to use truth as a weapon to shame people. We're not going to use truth as a weapon to guilt people or to condemn people. No, we're going to speak the truth in love because when the truth is spoken in love, it heals, it convicts, it restores, it reconciles, it builds, it strengthens people. And so maybe you're one of those people that think, well, I'm just one of those people that tells it like it is. Look to your past and see if there's a trail of people and relationships that have been restored. Look in your past and see if there's a a trail of lives who have been encouraged. Look and see if there's a, a trail of people who have been drawn closer to God and closer to God's people and closer to the church. Or look and see if there's a trail of body bags because you've left broken people and hurt people and divided people, and relationships that used to be are no longer because you spoke the truth, but you didn't speak the truth in love. I'm speaking the truth in love this morning. (laughs) Examine yourself. Evaluate yourself, not against somebody else, but against the standard of Christ. We're going to be people that speak the truth, but we're going to speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like the person next to me, like the church. No, no, no. Growing more and more like Christ, who's the head of his body, the church. He makes the body fit perfectly together as each part's of the body does its own special work here. He's bringing it back saying, hey, you've got something. You, you, you are, God made an investment in you. And as each part of the body, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, the apostle, the prophet, the, the administrator, the, the greeters, the ushers, the lovers, the prayers, the, the, the people with gifts of healing, the, as the entire body recognizes who I am, who I am in Christ, what God's put in me, what I have to offer the community of faith, who I am and what I can do as the entire body recognizes that and does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body, everybody say the whole body, the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And what a beautiful picture of what the church should be. But I think if you examine most churches, what you find is immaturity, you find strife, you find anger, you find frustration, you find comparison, you, you, you find factions and, and, and divisions of people that I wish we would do this, I wish we were more like this, I wish I was more used, I wish they don't recognize me. And, and all of these immaturities that are going on, but he says, hey, when the church recognizes who we are and what we can do together, the church is actually strengthened and brought together. In, in chapter two, Paul uses this analogy and he says this in verse 20. He says, remember that together, everybody say together. Together we are his house. Paul's using a couple of different metaphors throughout the book of Ephesians. He's just here in chapter four, used the m- m- uh, metaphor of a body and a person and the human body that is maturing and growing. And we can definitely relate to that and dig that and and pull that apart. And and we can all, we remember the awkwardness of puberty. And we we remember, you you guys remember your voice changing, how awkward that was and how weird that was. I remember going through that season and I was like, really God? Seventh grade, no no, no lie, a little little behind the scenes of Pastor Seth. Seventh grade, I was the only, I, I made an honors district choir at one of the colleges college universities there by us. We went and tried out and I I could actually sing a little bit. And so I made the choir, but I was the only boy in the soprano section. (laughs) I sang, I sang soprano, which if you don't know music, that's like the highest, you know, like that's way up there. And I, man, I could hit the high notes. And between my seventh grade and my eighth grade year, I hit that awkward stage of puberty and my voice started changing. And so in the eighth grade, I was one of two boys in the alto section. So it was good to be in eighth grade and be one of two in the entire female section, but we'll leave that alone. Um, Keep going. Exactly. Keep going. I don't even know where. Oh, chapter two together. 
We are his house. And we're being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, which what was the, apostle, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets? It was the foundation of Jesus. That's all they talked about. That's all they had an understanding about. That's all they delivered was, listen, we, we this church, are built on who Jesus is, what Jesus did. They continually brought it back. That was the foundation being laid. Matthew chapter 7, if we'll build our house on the rock, on the teaching of Jesus, on the instructions of Jesus, on the character of Jesus, on who Jesus was and what Jesus did. When the rains come, when the winds come, our house won't be tumbled, it won't crumble. And he says this, this together we are his house being built on a foundation of the apostles and the prophets and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made a part of this dwelling where God lives by spirit. So what is God trying to achieve? He's trying to bring a body together. He's trying to bring diversity and differences of gifts, difference of personality, difference of ethnic backgrounds, diversity together to make one body. He's saying together, we're not just a body, we are a house. And this house is intended to do something. It is intended to contain the spirit and the presence of God. And where the spirit of God is, there's freedom and there's healing and there's all of the benefits of serving and being in a relationship. And when you look at the metaphor of what God is doing, he's building a body, he's building a house. When you take the house analogy and you begin to break it apart a little bit, there's some things that you can understand really quickly. And here's a quick principle for you. If you've ever been in construction, anybody ever build a house? Okay, not some of you. You, you, hopefully your marriage has made it through that season. Um, it's difficult. There's a lot of things to choose and a lot of things to do and a lot of friction and tension sometimes. But when you build a house, how many of you want a, want a weak house? A house that's not very stable, that's got a shaky foundation, that when the wind blows, the house sways back and forth. No, nobody wants a weak house. How many of you want a strong house? You'd like for when the rains come and the storms come for the house to, to stay standing. Well, here's one thing that you need to understand is that a house is only as strong as two things. It's only as strong as the material it's made of. And it's only as strong as the connection and the relationship between those different materials. When you build a house, there's, and there's things that you would never dream that go in to the construction and to the building of that house. There's, you know, studs, there's, uh, you know, beams, there's drywall, there's electrical wiring, there's HVAC, there's plumbing. The plumbing is the most important part. My dad would say that, um, being a plumber. He says, if anybody has any ambition in life, they're going to be a plumber uh, because plumbers just rule the world. And, and I believe that. I was taught that. I agree with that. I know we've got some plumbers here that attend church. They're the most spiritual people in the church. Um, <laughs> You think I'm joking, but I'm not. <laughs> but there's all kinds of materials that go into the construction of a house. If you don't have strong materials, I mean, they're contractors that really care about the product they're building, really care about the customer, you know what they do? They stand at the lumber yard and they'll go to the, the section where you, where you buy the studs and you, and you know what they'll do? They don't just pick up and grab and, and toss. Nope, they look at every board. And they see if it's straight. They see if it's warped, if it's wonky. They look at its integrity. They look for imperfections in the stud because they know if they put weak material in the house, the house is going to be weak. They pay attention to the kind of nails that they use. And there are different kinds of nails. There are different lengths. There are different diameters. There, there's different sizes. There's different weights. Why? Because if they use the wrong connection in the wrong place, they know the house, the wall is going to be weak and the wall is going to be crumbled. And so a house is only as strong as the material it's made of and it's only as strong as the relationship between those materials. And we need to continually take our life and like the contractor, in comparison to the life of Christ, we need to look and see if we're warped. We need to look and see if we're bent. We need to look and see if we're broken. Because some of us 
don't look like that, some of us might feel a little bit more like this. How many of you, if you go to the lumber yard, you're picking up this bad boy? Not, I, I don't think anyone's picking this one up. It's rotted, it's splintered, it's deteriorated. It's kind of dead. It's laid out in the weather, it's rotted, it's probably got termites. There's all kinds of things dysfunctional. And here's the beauty of what Paul is saying through the book of Ephesians. As he's looking at an entire group of people and to a entire congregation, and he's saying, we need to grow up. You used to be this. You were dead. But you're not this anymore. You're this. But here's the problem. You're still living like this. You're still living in a place of being rotted and broken and rejected and like you have nothing to offer the world and like you're controlled by sin. So let's stop and let's recognize who you used to be, but let's more than anything mature and grow up and recognize who you actually are because you were dead and you were rotted, but now you're alive And there's been a transformation that was impossible without the work of Christ. Amen? Amen. You guys responded much better than Saturday night. You're now my favorite service. (laughs) And so there's a transition in verse 17. Because what Paul has done to this point is helped us learn. He's helped us learn some things. He's, he's sitting down and having a conversation, a grow-up conversation with a group of people who are believers, who've accepted Jesus, who love God's word, but they're just immature. They're unlearned. They don't know. And so for the first, I don't know how many verses, all the way from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to chapter 4, verse 16, he's done nothing but teach He's not given much instruction of, I need you to do this. I need you to stop this. I need you to change this. He's just taught them. Because if you want to be a person of strength, if you want to be a person of character, you have to learn who you are and stop living out of who you used to be. There has to be a learning It's one of the reasons we sat in here. It's one of the reasons we have Bible studies. It's one of the reasons we have COTMU. We want to continually create spaces and places where you can learn. Because what you allow and what you give permission to teach you has the power to shape you, has the power to form you. So when you let the six o'clock news teach you, it also has permission and power to shape you. When you let podcasts and Joe Rogan be the primary source of information, and that's what you're learning. It has the power and the permission to shape you. When you let social media be the primary source of information, and you chase down every piece of clickbait they put on there, and you are consumed with all of this information, guess what? It has the power and the permission to shape you, to shape the way that you think, to shape the way that you behave, to shape the way that you live. And Paul is saying, hey, let's stop letting those things be the primary source of information. And for just a few verses here in chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, I just wanna teach you something new. I wanna teach you who you are in Christ. I wanna teach you that God's given you every spiritual blessing through what Jesus did on the cross. I wanna teach you that you were chosen and you were predestined and you were called and you've been given a gift. And I wanna teach you that yes, you were dead, but now you're alive. Yes, I wanna teach you that you were separated in the old covenant it, but now in the new covenant, you're a part of God's family. When you believe and put your faith in Christ, I want to teach you that you're not saved by your good works. You are, you are saved by God's grace and through your faith and through your trust in Jesus. And then you were saved for good works. Now there's a good life that you're to live. There's some good that's to come out of you. There's some, I, I want to teach you that the church is about family and it's about relationship. And I want to teach you, I want you to learn some things. I want you to learn some things. But now in verse 17, he makes a transition. He says, I don't want you to just learn a bunch of information because strong people are not just smart people. 
Strong people are not just people that learn. Strong people are people that actually take what they learn and begin to apply it to their daily life. Look in verse 17. He says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do. Now, now listen to how ironic that statement is. Who's he talking to? Gentiles. And he's saying, hey, quit acting like a Gentile, Gentile. I got so mad at my wife. We were dating, my, I was dating my wife before we got married. And she's always had a spiritual gift to be able to push my buttons. <laughs> I mean, from the beginning, it was like a God gifted anointing. And she did something and irritated me. And I said, I turned around and I said, I wish you'd quit acting like a teenager. She said, well, I am a teenager. I was like, you little sucker. She was 19. (laughs) Just barely. But she was right. I was like, quit, quit acting like that. And here he is. He's like, quit acting like a Gentile, you Gentiles. But he starts to break apart. This is who you used to be. This is who you are. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives them because they've closed their minds and hardened their hearts against them. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure, and they eagerly practice every kind of of impurity. Here's the eye to eye, nose to nose conversation. But that isn't what you've learned. That's not who you are. But that's not what you've learned about Christ. And since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful self, your old sinful nature, your old natural way of living. Throw that off. It doesn't fit you anymore. You've outgrown it. You're different. You're not the rotten two before anymore. You've been transformed. You've been renewed. You've been reconciled. You've been brought into the family of God. So throw that off and throw off your former way of life which is corrupted by lust and deception. And instead, there's now something new that fits you. There's now something new that should dominate you. There is now a new, not just way of thinking, not just a salvation ticket that gets you into heaven. No, you stepped into a new family with a new culture, with a new behavior, with a new way of doing relationships, with a new way of living. But now... Instead, let the Spirit of God renew your thoughts, renew your attitudes, and put on your new nature. You're not this. You're this. So I need you to stop thinking like this. I need you to stop acting like this. And I need you to start embracing who you are in Christ. He's taking one of the first verses out of Ephesians chapter 1. I'm speaking to believers in Ephesus and in Christ. And he's digging into that idea a little bit more here. This is what it means to just be in Ephesus. This is what it means to just be a Gentile. This is what it means to be a sinner. This is what it means to be disconnected from God. This is what it means to be disconnected from God's people. And he's saying, I need you to stop it and instead let the Spirit of God renew your thoughts, renew your attitudes, and put on, recognize who you are. You were created to be like God. You are now a person that carries the image of God, carries the spirit of God. So when people see you and when they see your behavior, when they hear your words and they see how you do life, what they should see is Jesus that's truly righteous and truly holy. And then he gets into a lot of practical things. Stop telling lies, but let us be people that speak the truth. Stop sinning. When you get angry, stop letting anger control you. Stop letting anger go resolved. It doesn't literally mean don't, don't go to bed angry. Some, one of the best things you can do as a married couple when you're angry is go to bed. You need some sleep. You're tired. You're rested. You need to get rest and wake up tomorrow and have the conversation when you're sane. Okay. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> Say it again. Yeah. Oh. Uh. Don't use foul or abusive language. What's he, what's he bringing 
He says, listen, guys, when you, when you live, when you lie, when you get angry and you don't resolve that anger, when you use foul or abusive language, what do you do? You destroy relationships. You destroy people. The people in your life, when you lie, when you steal, you're going to leave them looking like this. They're going to be rotted and they're going to be broken. I want the people that leave your life because we're going to be people that tell the truth. We're going to be people that speak positively and speak words of life. And I want the people that leave your life Leave a relationship with you strengthened, transformed, introduced to Jesus, healed, forgiven, experiencing grace, experiencing patience, experiencing peace. Not only do I want you to be built, I want you to be a builder of people. I want you to strengthen. You've got the Spirit of God on the inside of you. Strengthen, encourage, build up the body of Christ. Because a church, a house, a family is only as strong as the materials it's made of. And it's only as strong as the connection and the relationship between those people. In verse 1 of chapter 5, he continues and says, I want you to be imitators of God. Not imitators of the world. Not imitators of this or of that. I want you to be imitators of God. Why? Because you're children of God. And all through here, he'll say, don't do this, do this. And in verse three, he says, let there be no sexual immorality or impurity or greed among you. Such place has no, and I love this, such sin has no place among God's people. What's he doing? This is who you are. He's not just saying, stop it. There's a great video, you can YouTube it, and this woman goes in for counseling, and she starts sharing her heart, and the, the, the character on the other side, the counselor, is Bob, Bob Newhart, if you remember him from the 80s, and, and, and he's sitting there, and he's listening, and she's like, I got this problem, and I got this problem, and I got this thing, and I got this, and, and he says, and she, and he's like $5, $5 a session, puts the $5 on the table. She's like, this is really cheap, this is really weird. He goes, I know, it's, it's easy. Stop it. She's like, but I have this problem and I have this problem and, and I'm claustrophobic and I, and, I, and I don't know and I, and I don't know like this and I don't like this. And he says, stop it. She goes, bah, da, 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 bah, da, da, da. and he's like, two words, stop it. And then he says, stop it or I'll do everything that you're scared of. I'll put you in the closet and I'll lock you in there and I'll throw snakes in there and I'll do everything that you're, just stop it. And and wouldn't it be awesome if that was, it was that easy just to look at people and say, hey, stop it. Paul's not looking at you and saying, stop it. He's saying, this is who you are. You're not the person who naturally sins. You're not the person that's dead. You are God's people. You are children of God. And so understand who you are and live out of that. And then he begins to talk about who you're allowing to influence you. Look at verse six. He says, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins for the anger of God will fall on those who disobey him. He says, here's here's what's gonna separate us. There are those of us that are in Christ And then there are those of us that are not in Christ. And that's now the separation. It's not our politics. It's not our uh, color of our skin. It's not our gender. It's not our social status. None of those things are, are any longer dividing lines. Here's the divider. The in Christ and those that are not in Christ. That's the difference. But listen, here's, here's what's different is that the door to in Christ is always open. And so when you live like God's people, when you're a family, when you have relationships, when there's peace, when there's grace, when there's mercy, when there's forgiveness, when there's healing, working in the community, the people that are not in Christ are over here looking at you saying, man, I wish my life was like that. Hey, is, is there room for, for me? And there's always a yes. There's always a yes, you're welcome here. Yes, come in here. Yes, let me teach you who you can be and who you are in Christ. 
And he says, don't be fooled by those that don't believe in Christ, those that are sinning, those that are living, those that are angry at God, those that are living in darkness, because that's who you used to be. But now you have the light of God living on the inside of you. Verse 15 probably just sums it up. So be careful how you live. How you live matters. How you live matters. Some people would tell you that it doesn't. Well, just the grace of God. You know, where sin abounds, grace abounds that much more. That's an awesome scripture that I love. But that doesn't give us permission to just go out and say, well, I'm just going to do whatever. No, how, how we live matters. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. What, what is a wise person? A wise person is a person that's learning who they are in Christ. A wise person doesn't just learn something, but they actually apply what it is that they've learned to their daily life. They're allowing this in Christ reality and this in Christ life begin to trans. And it's a process. The Bible says we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. It's a progressive work that God is doing. But here's the promise from Jesus. He said, the work that I started in you, I'll make sure to finish it. If you'll just stay in partnership with me, if daily you'll continue to learn and daily you'll continue to apply what it is that you're learning. And then thirdly, a wise person is very careful who they give permission to influence them, what community they're a part of. And a lot of what Paul is saying here in, the, in part of chapter five is be very careful what community, what family you're a part of. Because your community has a profound impact and a profound influence on how you live your life. Make sure you recognize you're a part of God's family. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Father, we thank you. You're building something here. You're you're doing something. You're working in the lives of the people. And today, you're just having a a grow-up conversation with us. Helping us recognize who we used to be. But more importantly, helping us recognize who we are today. Father, we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. Every head's bowed and every eye's closed. I just want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. As I held up these two pieces of wood, you look at both of them and you might say, my life probably looks more like the rotted two before. There's holes and there's hurt and there's rot and there's shame and there's guilt. And I feel just a million miles away from God. I'm not even sure that God knows who I am. Listen, today you can make a decision that causes that season of your life to be over and you can step into a new life, a transformed life. The Bible says that when we step into a relationship with Jesus, our old life is erased, it's, it's done away with. And we get to step into a new journey, into a new process, into a new walk, into a new relationship with a new beginning to where we get to grow and mature into this new life that God's got for us. And we can be totally transformed. And that happens when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, that we believe that he's the son of God. We believe that he took our place and paid the price for our sin when he died on the cross that he was buried and on the third day was resurrected transformed to life and now is seated at the right hand of the father when we believe that and we confess that with our mouth Romans tells us that we are saved we are born again and we get to start this new transformed life I think you know that that's the position you're in, that's the choice that's in front of you right now. Believers are praying for you. This week, believers have been praying for you because God knew that you were coming and knew that this was a significant moment of choice for you. Nobody's looking around, we're not gonna embarrass you. But if that's you, would you just have the courage 
to slip your hand up and say, hey, that's me. Would you pray for me? Anybody just want to give you a minute? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else join these few? What a powerful transformational moment. The work that God does right now in these moments is so critical and so amazing. Anybody else? Church, we're going to pray together and we're going to pray with and along with these individuals that have responded. And we're going to believe that today, by the grace of God and through their faith, through their trust, we're going to join with them and we're going to believe that this is a transformational moment in their life, that they're starting a new walk. Would you, in the entire room and those, especially those that raised their hand, would you just repeat after me and pray this with integrity and with your full heart? Just say, Father, today I come to you and I ask for forgiveness. I've made mistakes. I've messed up. But today... I thank you for what Jesus did on the cross, that he took my place. He paid the price for my sin. And Jesus, today, I ask you to come into my heart to be the Lord of my life, to be the leader of my life. I give my all to you. And I make a commitment to surrender to you, to submit to you, and to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for saving and setting me free. In Jesus' name, amen.